Heavenly session off though uh, really reflecting on last week Deacon Bowser was here to kick off this the part of this series and uh, he was actually a session basically uh, was dealing with God's kingdom serving God's kingdom mm -hmm. and how we were going to serve God's kingdom and that was by ex extending uh, our time our talents and our resources to the building of God's kingdom. And that's really what we were focusing on. And to do that, we first have to acknowledge that what? We live in God's kingdom. Do we do that all the time? No. I mean, our lives are so fast. We're running all the time. We're doing things all the time. We are running from here to there. We're going to jobs. We are. We're going to uh, uh, leisure events. Disposable time is going to things that we enjoy doing that make gives us pleasure and things of this nature here. And a lot of times, I don't think we always get God-centered in everything we do. Because we're just running all the time. We're running with people. We're not with all God's people all the time. When we come together, we're with our family and our, our brothers and our sisters. But we're impacted all the time with other people who don't know God's word or anything about it. So we get a little bit off track a lot of the times. So we're not focusing it. So we always got to come back to truly what we should be doing. And God has given us spiritual gifts that we should be utilizing to building up his kingdom. And that's the, our time, our talent, and our resources. And that's what we were focusing on last week. And um, it's, I don't want to say it's tough, but it, it is tough. Because we are what? We're human. We are frail creatures. So every day, what do we need to do? We need to kill that old self out every day, every morning. And really focuses on God, being in communion with Him. So that again, everything that we do, we're going to make sure that we are glorifying Him at all times. It's very, very critical that we're doing that at all times. We talked about last week about the man, and I guess it was in Luke, yeah, Luke 18, where a man had everything. He had wealth. He had. Uh, he was following God's instructions. He was doing, he was being obedient to God's word. But then when he asked Jesus, what can I do? Jesus told him, sell everything you have and follow me. And it truly got down to the essence of what? What was his true God? What was his true idol? He couldn't do it. He was very displeased. So again, it really comes down to, and that's a difficult thing to really try to think through. Um, 
do we are we always focused on God? Are we always focused on God to a point where we're always putting Him first? And the only way we can do that is still be in communion with Him, being talking to Him, having a relationship with Him, reading His Word, and doing uh, just trying to stay in touch with God because if we don't, we will get off path. We get off kilter on what we're doing all the time. We are frail. We are, like I said, we, we make the mistakes all the time. But because uh, of Jesus, it's, everything's okay. Everything's okay. So there are things in our lives that, uh, again, we struggle, what? We, that we, struggle, we uh, show strong interest in. Uh, we put some of those things. What do, we do, what do we do with our disposable time? Some of them we do sports. I like to play golf. I had everybody should, if you don't know what I do, I got I got a few what I call vices. I do. I like Starbucks and I like golf. <laughs> I know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mislead you. I'm the Lord. I, I, I'm over. I, I, he's my God. I'm, I'm, I'm over the top, but I do have a few things that. Get, and and, I, and not all of you have things that basically interest you and that please you, whether it may be decorating your house, whether it may be doing your job, doing it in a fashion that is really going to glorify God, that, again, that makes you happy, that makes you feel successful, that you feel good about yourself, raising your kids so that they would know God, that they are in tune with God and have a personal relationship with God, doing what you're supposed to be doing. All of those things are good. Some of them are, that we need to do, some of them are good because they make us pleasing. But there's nothing more important than putting God first. No matter what I just said, God has to come first in your lives on an individual basis. On an individual basis, you got to put him first. And when we're putting him first, then you're going to be compelled to use your time, your talents, and your resources help build his kingdom. So again, that was the focus of last week. We we, we really enjoyed uh, digging Bob and going through that, and it was just a, a fun time, which leads us into tonight, what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I have, I must say, this uh, is August 9th, yes. two-thirds through this Bible study for 2017 very clearly with you. I don't know if there's a better Bible study lesson than tonight. <laughs> I'm going to be very truthful with you. Y'all are good. Y'all are good. But tonight, what are we going to be talking about? Spreading. Spreading the good news. Spreading the good news. Oh my God. God, thank you for the good news. So we're going to open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We give all honor to you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here this evening, Father God. This is your house, Father God. And we've come to study together, to join together, to do your word, to be in your word. We thank you, Father God, for all that you have done for us this day. We ask for forgiveness right now, Father God, where we have gone off and not been in tune or been in in good graces with what you would have us to do. Father God, we pray right now that each and every one of us would have a, a longing for the Great Commission. Lord, I would ask, Lord, that you place on each and every one of our minds, Father, those who may not have heard the gospel, who are unsaved, Father God, place those people in our minds, in our hearts, that we may know, Lord God, and give us a yearning, Father God, to reach out to them, Lord, to share our faith with them, Father God, to share the gospel with them, oh, Father God. We want to do your will, Father God. Mm -hmm. Touch someone this evening, touch each and every one of us this evening, Lord, to truly get behind what you would have us to do, Lord, to be truly servants unto you, Lord, and for truly, Father God, Compel us, Father God, to do your will in making disciples. To have a yearning to join with others, Father God, in help discipling them, Father God, and bringing them the good word and helping them to mature in all 
that you would have us do, Father God. So we just thank you for this, Lord. We, we praise you for this, Father God. And we give it all to you. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, session six. Session six. Spreading the good news. In this session, we'll see how evangelism is both narrow and broad. <coughs> it's narrow because it's only and always about Jesus. It's only and always about Jesus. It's not about anything that we do. It's not about how good we are. It's not about what I'm doing for Jesus. It's not about serving in this church. It's not about helping your neighbor. It's not about loving your neighbor. That's all good. We love all things about it. But it's about what? It's about Jesus. And it's only about Jesus. And we should never lose sight. Because it's what he did. And it's not what we did at all. It's broad because the good news is about the gospel, and it has, and both it has both personal and cosmic ramifications. You know, everyone loves to get the good news, whether it is from a friend. Hey, somebody just had a, a great day. Uh, your friend just told you that, you know, I just got a new baby. Uh, I just got a promotion at work. Uh, they had good news. They spread it and they're giving it to you. Whether it's from your spouse, you know that your spouse gave you something nice and they're in love with you. Hey, that's good news. From your teacher, you got, you got a great job. I mean, you got a great grade. Your teacher's going to grade on the curve. Good news. Of <laughs> course. <laughs> From your boss, you're going to get a promotion. You're doing good work, good well. From the doctor, hey, I got a good bill of health. Everybody really appreciates that. That is really good news. From a mechanic, yeah, my car is bad. Man, how much is it going to cost me? Hey, it's only a hundred. What? Thank you, Lord. Good news. So, we, and, and this news is always received with warm welcome. But why is it? That the gospel, which literally means good news, can also be difficult for us to share. Why does it stir up feelings of inadequacy, stress, obligations, anxiety, fear, and rejection? Perhaps we have forgotten that the good news of the gospel is actually the greatest news that has ever been delivered. It is truly the greatest news that's ever been delivered. When we talk about the good news, I can't tell you. There should be a smile on everybody's face. It should make you just feel warm and tingling inside. <laughs> it should just make you feel great. Or it should not be, I've heard it so much, whether it's time on Sunday or Wednesday or, oh Lord, I've gotten used to it. Okay, I know what the gospel is. <laughs> Do we sometimes ignore it because it has come, you know, it's like, hey, we know about the gospel. It's okay. But no, it is the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. It is the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. Was that a good gossip? Well, I'm going well, well, to ask you, what's, what's your good news? What is good news to you? Does anybody have any good news? Did anybody have any good news that they heard? Did anybody share any good news with you? Do you have any good news to share tonight? In our I got to say it all is okay. Good job, Mr. Good news. Look at that. Hey, fantastic. Anybody else? What other good news? We have good news all the time. I'm here and I'm alive. There you go. I'm here and I'm alive. You appreciate it. You're here and alive. Breathing well. Can see. Can smell. Can taste. Can feel. Can walk. That's good news. Any other good news? I just had a grandson. Order to my baby. Good news. What a blessing. My kids are grown and independent. Take care of yourself. <laughs> Great news. <laughs> Fantastic news. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, God. Good news. Anybody else got any good news? Good news. 
Good news makes you feel good. Again, whether it's about you, or whether it's about your neighbor, about your friend, or even somebody you see on TV. You don't even know them. And you hear a good news story. It makes you feel good. You like to share those types of things. And we tell people about it, but when it comes to the gospel, do we feel somewhat reserved and resigned not to share this with your next door neighbor, with the friend that you know or possibly could be on the line or you know may not know Christ? We should be doing that all the time. We should have a desire to share that good news all the time. Because, like, again, I'll say it again. There's no better, there's no better good news. I guess I'm English, my English teacher there, <laughs> <laughs> than the gospel. That was a book that reminds me of uh, Proverbs that I learned when I was a kid. Before I start losing my memory, I can remember all the stuff I learned back then, but I can't remember from you now. But in Proverbs 25, 25, it says, as cold water to, to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Awesome. So it lets you know that good news can refresh you. Yes, that's right. Very, yeah. Sure will, it can. It can refresh you. Again, I just think it, it makes you feel good. And again, we hear good news all the time. And again, we share good news all the time. But we should be con the conscious of the true good news of Christ and what he did for us. And also, I'm thinking about myself being guilty. We have to be mindful of the, in the manner in which we want to share that good news. Mm -hmm. You know, our heart has to be for the purpose of sharing Christ with these individuals. And I say I'm guilty in the way that I have a neighbor and they have a baby. Well, the, the girl is about two or three years old now. And for some, fun, for some unknown reason, they feel like every time we pull up in the driveway, they have to come. <laughs> We're just getting off of work. They have to come. They have to come over and talk. And, and I said to Mary, and Lord, forgive me, but I said to him, I said, you know, next time they come over there, I'm going to say, I'm going to bring up the church, and I'm going to bring up the Lord, and I'm going to bring up the church. You're going to stop coming over. You're going to stop coming over. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Yeah, we have to be mindful of the heart and the spirit in which we share. Yeah, a lot of times, what you're saying is, I guess we feel like people are going to reject the news, and we don't share it. So, I mean, kind of like what you said, you know, they come over, they're going to they're gonna want to reject this, it's going to be offensive to them. But, um, we can't look at it that way. Well, I know for a fact it will for them. <laughs> I invited, I invited their mother, I mean, well, the girl's mother, to church with me, and she right away told me I'm Catholic, and I told her we don't, we, we're not into denomination. You know, I, I talked to, talk to her about the Lord, but then she said, well, my daughter and her husband, they want nothing to do with it. So that's the mindset I had to say it was wrong. <laughs> Well, one that we do pass it on. Then, I mean, do we think? I mean, we think about it as news as we pass it on. Mm -hmm. Because we pass on news, there's no responsibility other than pass on the news. Mm -hmm. But when we pass on the gospel, I think somehow in our mind there's some kind of responsibility that we got. Yeah. <laughs> of course, we wanted to get it right. <laughs> and then, you know, I don't, I don't know. It, it makes it a little bit more tense because it's so expectation here other than just good news. I mean, hey man, I got good news. Let me tell you this. You know, and then let it go. <laughs> and with that being said, I think it's because we accept the expectation on ourselves right. instead right. of knowing that the expectation is on God to draw them to him. Right. So we try to, you know, do the work all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we do try to take that on ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> but the person got to be I think the person gotta be gotta be willing to hear it. Right. 
time is not supposed to be here. There has to be a discernment between you and the Holy Spirit to make sure that the right opportunity is there to share the word. Let, let me ask you this. Um, how would you define the gospel? Can Jesus. someone define the gospel? Pray the news of Jesus. Pray the news about Jesus. Pray the news about Jesus. Redemption. Redemption. The story that, that Jesus was the Son of God, came, lived, died for our sins so that we could have eternal life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One sentence, two. Anybody else interpret that? Well, how, do, how, how, do you, how do you address this with people when you, when you talk to them about the good news? Is everybody comfortable? Does anybody have any um, insights, tools, in which you may think that you may want to address or bring up the gospel? with somebody else who may you don't know or maybe a, an acquaintance of yours who you don't know whether they know the good news or they may have heard it, they may not have heard it. Does anybody have any any I intro? Think all come to a hard time. I'm sorry? People just have a hard time. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's when they... So when you say hard times, yeah. how, describe that for me. When they are sick or either they are trying to better their lives by like getting off drugs. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Okay. That, well, that, that's probably an easy intro because there's something that's happening in their lives that is not that perfect. So you have an entree into it. But suppose the person is not sick. Suppose the person is doing all well in their job. Suppose they're doing, they think they're doing well, let's say that way. Uh, uh, they don't, don't, don't have any need from a say, financial perspective, but they're doing things in nature. Um, I was with an outside vendor person was always very helpful. I would ask, you know, him to show me things that I knew that he shouldn't have shown me, you know, when we were working on servers mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. And um, I kept asking God how to share the gospel with him because I knew he didn't go to church. I knew he didn't, you know, um, deal with the Lord. So um, I approached him, you know, after prayer, I, I asked him one day that we were working together and said, um, hey, you know, we can talk about anything, but there's something, you know, we've never talked about. You know, is it okay if I talk to you about church and God? And he just point blank told me, um, well, I don't go to church and I don't talk about religion, but I'll talk with you, which was only God having opened that to allow me to do it. And so at the time I gave him, um, you know, we talked and I, I had a, like a, a sermon from um, whatever the guy, I can't think of his name now. Um, and he listened to it. And so um, before we could get back together again, he got promoted. So he wasn't coming to the office anymore. So I just asked God, to please put somebody else in his path, you know, that could share the right. gospel with him. So I had to ease into that because we were already working great together, but the reason I was asking was because he was a nice person, but he would go to, I knew he would go to hell if he didn't right. have a relationship with me. Right. So coming from that angle, I was like, Lord, I don't want him. And how long did you know him before this just happened? Uh, a couple of years. A couple of years. Mm -hmm. So the discernment of the Holy Spirit gave you the opportunity at that specific point in time that you listen to your discernment to, uh, to put an entree, you know, to bring that up with him. But it goes back to what you're saying that um, he, you knew he was a nice person and you didn't want him to go to hell. Do we have that thought that here's someone I've known, I have this relationship with, whether it's um, your barber or your beautician, with that if they were to die, how would I feel about that? Mm -hmm. And I was at um, my Bible study fellowship one time. They was talking about sharing the gospel. And, they were, and the leader there was saying that for years, she'd been here like 14 years, and her and her husband ate at this restaurant like two, three times a week. And they got to know the manager, and he was a nice person. But then he died. Mm -hmm. You know, all, for 14 years, they never said anything to him about sharing, about Jesus. And they went to this funeral, and truly it was a funeral for someone who did not know 
Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wow. And this made me think, like, who do I know that I see all the time that, that I patron that I do not share with? And that next day I was on the way to get my hair done. And in the car I'm driving, I'm like, Lord, please give me the words. Help me. You know, what should I say to my beautician? Because if she dies, you know, I don't want her to go to hell. And so I'm in there the whole time, I'm like nervous. And I'm like, I know that she's done my hair for like 13 years. And I'm like, what do I say? And we went on talking. I said, I see you in two weeks. I said, you know what? I can't leave. I said, I got something to ask you. And she was like, what? I said, I can't leave here without asking you, have you trusted in Christ? It, it just came out. You know, I just, it just, and then and she was like, you know what? Um, I just don't go to church like I should. You know, and I, I went on talking to her and I invited her to Bible study fellowship. And the next week she came. And in, I mean, she's been coming all the time. You know, and she's enjoying the study. And just this past week, she says, hey, I can't wait till next month because we start the study of Romans. But just thinking about the people in your life that you see all the time mm -hmm. and they don't know Christ. And just to open up the door because they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the message. And so that's not thinking about, well, if I ask them how they gonna think, what they're going to think about me, it doesn't matter what they think about me. Do you know Jesus Christ? It reminded me of situation that uh, I was uh, living in the village in the Dominican Republic with uh, uh, one of my uh, friends that was the director uh, of the International Bachelor Program at Hillside and we were placed in a, one of the family homes and I was in a bedroom with the baby kids and, and, we, and I, when I, when I first, first day I got to the Dominican um, the plane American Airlines lost all my luggage. So mm -hmm. I was without clothes. So the people in the village had to run out of it. was amazing, these four people, they, were, they went out <coughs> they put, they gave their shirts off their back mm -hmm. and gave it to me. Mm -hmm. And this fellow that was roaming with me, there were seven of us on the mission trip. Um, it, uh, I was praying for my luggage, to get my luggage to be found and so forth. It took me about three days. So I was there in a remote area in the Seminole Valley up in the Pine Mountains. And um, these villagers were looking after me, and I was wearing the same clothes that they gave me. <laughs> Wash them out, bring them back. And <clears throat> if we got in a I got in a conversation with this uh, person that flew over with me. Um, come to find out, you know, because he would see me praying, and, and I would um, say things like, Thank you, Jesus, the Lord, and the rest of the faith. You know, things that exemplify my faith because, like I said, I was in a farm and he spoke the language. We speak very good Spanish. And so, um, come to find out, you know, he, he he just up and told me, he said, well, you know I'm atheist. And I said, no, I didn't know. I, because he's one of the nicest people you ever want to meet. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I didn't know. I, you know so I, he proceeded to tell me why he was an atheist. He said he was both a Catholic. And he just, as he got older, he just saw so much hypocrisy in it that when he left his family, his parents and whatnot, and he knew you married and he had a small kid, um, but he had just had a daughter, Lauren, just a month before we went over. Uh, but he said he just didn't believe that these people were worshiping the right things because it was just process. So at that time I didn't <clears throat> really know, I don't think I was prepared to really go into the gospel. But I listened to him and, and over the period of time we, we, we grew closer and he, he would share things with me and we, we got to be real close and then when he came back, like I said, he stayed at Hillside for about a year and then he transferred uh, to a job in Annapolis, Maryland. But when I go back, when I look at that, and, and I thank the opportunity that, you know, Mennonites, because we didn't have TV, we didn't have electricity, didn't have running water. And so we would sit around campfires and sing and talk and, and commune. And all the other, the, the locals, they were in Catholicism. They were all, because the one church that was there was a Catholic. And then I really found out that a lot of 
findings that have taken place when they joined the migration of the Europeans from Germany and what about the coming of the synagogues and things. I didn't go in and trap people in the park and just do the day of the living. But uh, when you start talking about the gospel, sometimes I think that uh, you can take the gospel with you without sometimes meet God puts you in the midst of a situation where it's sometimes because it <clears throat> because I think for him when I left there when we got back, uh, in fact one of one of the members uh, lost his passport and he had to leave him there. Mm -hmm. So he had to join us and I started to pray for him. So that was uh, a, you know an amazing thing to, to have someone that saying that no I don't worship a God but yet he joined us. So I just say a lot of times you just have to <clears throat> if, if you don't uh, have the book hand, uh, but the word is, if the word is in you, and that's why when I the pastor tell us to read and study that stuff, when the word is in you, you God is going to reveal to you how to relate to those individuals that come to pass. And, and I just, I, I just think that every day that you walk is a day meant for you to uh, go out with the gospel. Because if you, once you convert, that's a disciple. That's that's your soul mission. Yeah, everybody should have a testimony. Everybody does have testimonies. Mm -hmm. Whether you've ever thought through it, whether you ever want to share it with someone else, but you really should think through that so that you can share it with someone else. Mm -hmm. We have many testimonies, mm -hmm. but it may be something that really will motivate you or that keeps you focused on who God truly is in your life. And you know that. And being willing to share that. Knowing the word is good. Being able to go to scripture is really good. But telling somebody who God is in your life, that's personal. There's nothing more critical than that. The key point is like that. As disciples, we are sent by Jesus to embody the good news of the gospel with both words and our lives. And as you were talking, I thought about that. It's not just telling someone about the gospel. Sure. You should embody it. Yeah, you right. and, you know, because sometimes just being cordial and nice to somebody will get you listened to. Yes. And right. you know, they will at least reward, you know, reward you with listening. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay, okay, let me share this with you. And again, there's nothing wrong. We, we went from house to house. You trusted in Christ. If you knew, if you, would you know if you died tomorrow, what would happen to you? Or you would mean, that's a question. And that's good. I'll share with you one thing which I think I, I, I picked up over the years, way back probably it was in a little church on the road there, uh, and it stayed with me for a long time, which is something really simple. Send somebody, you can just ask somebody, how's your spiritual life going? That will open up so many opportunities for you where I'm not asking you what your faith is or anything. This is how you do it. They may come back with any kind of way, but you are talk to them, whether they're an atheist or whatever it is. How's your spiritual life going? And whether I know them from, can, I don't know whether they ever opened a Bible, been to a church or whatever. Somebody's going to respond to that. And it's, I found out one time it's been offensive to anybody. But you can go so many different directions. So I just answer one little question. And again, I'm not trying to ask them about what's what going on. It's how's your spiritual life? Because once you say Jesus, right? It can, but it gives you an opportunity to get, yeah, to get there. To get to where you want to go. Okay, let's move along to this. Perhaps one of the most fascinating accounts of evangelism in the Bible is found in Acts 17. Luke records an extraordinary detail how the Apostle Paul shared the good news of Jesus of Jesus to the Greeks in a way that was both personal and cosmic in the same, at the same time. As you read this passage, pay attention to the details from his description of the scene. Underlying words or phrases that either stand out as significant, surprising, or needing further explanation. Okay. Since we don't have a few, I'll have every group around 
but I got some people on the outside here. I'm not sure what, how, how advantageous that's going to be. <laughs> so let's just read this. All right, Paul stood in the middle of Aragopas and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every aspect. Did anything jump out to anybody there? Extremely, extremely religious. Extremely religious. What does that mean? What, did I, what, what do you think he's meaning by that? For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, Objects of their worship. So again, just religious. That's how you do. I even found an altar. I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. So who were they? Worshipping. <laughs> Therefore, what you worship is ignorance. He was very clear to them. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, the God that made everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. That's our God, the one true God. Does not live in shrines made by hands. So nothing that we did. Nothing we did at all. Neither is he served by human hands. And again, those hours, respect to us, as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. All of our essentials right there gives us life, breath, and all things. From me, from uh, from one man, he has made. Now again, he made every nationality to live over the whole earth, and has determined their appointments, the appointed times, and the boundaries of where they live. So God has already done this. Where are we going to be? We're here tonight. <laughs> We're here tonight because we was appointed to be here tonight. By the grace of God. He did this so that they might seek God, seek him, and perhaps they might reach out and find him. They have the ability to find God, each and every one of us. Though he is not far from each of us, right now. He's not in some foreign country. He's not in some foreign world. He's not on Pluto. He's not in Venus. He's not in Los Angeles. He's not in North Korea. He's right here with you. For in him we live and move and have our being as even some of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring. We are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. It's nothing substantive, something that is, what you think, as precious stones or anything like that. It is the divine nature. An image fashioned by art, human art, and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, where they are, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He's going to judge the world 
Everybody's going to be judged in righteousness by the man he has appointed. Jesus. Jesus. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Three days he raised. He went to his father to intercede for each and every one of us. Remember what we said. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. Anything I that stood out that was really significant to anyone? I think what was amazing about this, this scripture, if I remember correctly, it was in Greece, and in this place where they assembled, it's where all the really the judicial and the smart people, they were assembled. And one of the things they really liked to do was hear wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so, because you know Paul was approaching them, he had to kind of be careful how he approached them to get them to listen. So he had to bring them some wisdom. Wisdom. Mm -hmm. and, so, question, right? and the other thing about the Greeks is that they had many gods. They worshipped yeah. everything. everything. <laughs> Water, <laughs> rivers. <laughs> and so by him approaching them, you know about their you know worship and about their religion. It actually gave him common ground with them so that they could listen to what he had to say. Because I thought when he said, you know, you're worshiping in ignorance, I thought that would make him mad. But, <laughs> but I guess because he was bringing wisdom, you know, they were willing to listen. Yeah, this is at Morris Hill, and really uh, the judges who were, I guess, appointed uh, to judge and to hear uh, different cases at that time uh, were known as being very practical being very just. And this is what he was speaking to, you know, the people at, you know, at this time. So. One thing for me was, you know, um, as we were going through that he made every nationality. Every and nationality. The reality is people that, as we live, as we speak to, are not going to always look like us. That's right. Um, and so it's so natural. It's easy to talk to someone who looks like you about the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy when they're of a different nationality. You don't know what you know who what they're worshiping. And so it's really right recognizing that we as we're called, we're called not to just your comfort zone. It's That's really right. being able to recognize that God has made everyone. He's going to judge the world, and that we need to be intentional of speaking out. Of that. The world. That's right. All. So, is it critical for us to try to understand other nationalities, other cultures, <coughs> other people? If you're going to try to, again, as I told you in that con casual conversation, to talk to someone, you really got to know where they're coming from. Right. Or you just going to be hitting walls after walls after walls. There's something. That's depending in their disposition or how they grew up or what they believe or how they can be impacted by certain things but you don't understand that you know you can be hitting a wall all the time he um, as has been said Paul identified with them because in verse 28 it says um, for in him we live and move and have our being as even some of your own prophets have said so he knew mm -hmm. um, who they were studying and you know things that they had had learned and Old Mount Zion, uh, or at the previous location of Mount Zion, we did affinity groups one time, and we learned how to um, find out what your affinity is with someone else. So somebody's affinity, like yours, is golf, or somebody's affinity might be shoes. And we had, you know, we did these little groups, and um, we learned how to find common ground in order right. to open up the discussion. Mm -hmm. And and that's all it is, is mm -hmm. finding common ground right. with yeah. another human being. Right. You know, it's not like it's that they're an alien, right? right. Mm -hmm. Just another human being. <laughs> that's right. Mm -hmm. What is something that you can have general conversation about? Right. Mm -hmm. What struck me when I read when we read this uh, earlier was uh, the bravery of the man standing in the center of the <laughs> given that because he knew he did know that they had different beliefs and all in Baltimore. Standing in front of them all and saying, That's wrong. And, and, and in fact, he, he used the word ignorance. I found a 
lot of bravery in, in, in his statements. I mean, I've, been, I've, I've had opportunities to witness one on one, but I don't know how comfortable I feel walking into a synagogue and say, you're missing the Messiah's I, I, I see a lot of I, I see a lot of bravery in, in, in this person. Who's both? Because God already has the appointed time for everything to occur. That's right. Yeah, it's not our responsibility. We sow the seed. Mm -hmm. That was you something know. like that. Was something like, the, uh, like she said, God set the tone mm -hmm. for us and all that happened. He's powerful. Mm -hmm. He's awesome. Mm -hmm. He is the creator. And the reason the word observe stood out to me was because he was intentional. He was paying attention That's right. to was. what was going on around him, opposed to just trying to everything get through the crowd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, um, yes, John. Um, I was going to say, I think it's, I guess this is the question. It raises the question of how important is it to know when you're going to approach someone, right? Let's say they're another, let's say they believe in something else. Mm -hmm. How knowledgeable are you in what they believe in? Because honestly, me, I don't know that much about a lot of other religions. If you come to me with the oh, I'm Islam or I'm Muslim, like I don't have I don't have a knowledge of your your base to kind of like come to that common ground. So right. it's like to what how much knowledge do you have of someone else's religion or other religions in general to be able to get to that common ground? Because I don't really have much knowledge of other religions. So that may be something that we should have knowledge of, you know, me personally. Well, I think it's <laughs> advantageous. There was, but as long as you know who, what you believe in mm -hmm. and what right. God's word is, right. if that's what you're sharing. Yeah, yeah, I'm not trying to say it from a perspective because, again, we should never be in a situation where we get into this debate. Right. Right. We're sharing God's word. Right. It's advantageous to know, just to be able to communicate with somebody. But again, I, I, I just don't see it as the, up, the, the end of all things. Yeah. Yeah. You still should be willing and, 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 uh, having the desire, you know, to share your faith, mm -hmm. specifically, share your faith. But again, like I said, it's good to know God's word across the board, and we should be learning it all the time. Mm -hmm. But truly, everybody has a testimony to share your faith, what God has done for you. Mm -hmm. That's what you're sharing with people. And I think that's what's important, because we had a class we talked before. I think uh, um, the informant had talked about sharing with your Islamic brother, other people. And the thing is, you won't know everything. I don't even know everything about the Bible. The Bible. So I, all I know is the testimony. All I know is what God has done for me. And that's what I'm sharing. And that's yes. what I believe. Yes. And, and I mean, it's up to them to yes. take it or leave. Because like you said, it's not debatable. It says not, we don't have to debate the word of God. All we're doing is sharing. You just share what you know. And you don't have to know about all these other religions. This is a religion. This is what I believe in. And this is what I'm sharing. I'm sharing what God has done for me. And Jesus Christ going to the cross to save my life. And I think that's the intimidating part for people is the feeling as if you need to know mm -hmm. the Bible upside down, left, right. You watch, you know, or you watch these things and you see it publicly, even when you listen to Paul or um, to Peter, it's like, it seems like it's just so eloquent. Mm -hmm. And so when you don't have the ability to be that eloquent, mm -hmm. it's easy to shy away. Yes. Or, you know, mm -hmm. one thing that came to mind when talking about this is um, God is not dead movie. You know, so of course, here they're in the philosophy class, and you know, he's going through and he's having a very interesting discussion with lots of research. When you see it, it's like, you know, who can, but that's kind of says the intimidating part mm -hmm. because people want to feel comfortable knowing all the answers, knowing kind of the big picture as opposed to mm -hmm. keeping it simple. Know yeah. what you know and be able to share your faith and your testimony right. um, as a starting point. Now, if you don't know others, I say one approach could be is ask a lot of questions, right? So, mm -hmm. if you're talking to someone who's Muslim, you don't know what they believe, uh, ask them. 
listen, because then you'll you'll understand from where they're coming from. As long as you know really what Christianity is, if you understand that, then you can find out. Well, tell me, what does it mean to be saved in Islam? What do you got to do to be saved, right? So I want to hear, because because I know what it takes to be saved. It's totally different, right? So I might not know. If you already know, ask questions may be a good way too. But but that's one way to lead, because then you start to find out information, right? But mm -hmm. you got to know what you believe, right? Mm -hmm. You really do, and uh, and and more and more understand, because it's one thing to talk to a, a religion that's totally different, but then you go talk to a Hebrew Israelite, <laughs> who yes. quotes from the Bible, yes. yeah. mm -hmm. you, they will throw you off if you're not firm, yeah. right? Because they'll take stuff out of context, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll sound, well, that sounds pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> oh, they're talking about uh, Abraham, Moses, and all of them, and you know, they're throwing that stuff in. So, so you gotta, you know, you may not know everything, but you need to be confident enough to know uh, what Christianity is at the basis of the gospel, right? Yes. Uh, because otherwise, when you start talking, to, or you talk to a Mormon, because they'll throw around familiar words, with Jehovah's Witness, right? So it's one thing to talk to a Hindu, it's totally different, but you start talking to ones that say they're Christian, uh, so you need to know firmly, I do believe, because they will use Bible words, but they won't mean the same thing. So you, I think as, um, as believers, when we are sharing the gospel, I mean, there are really fundamental truths and presumptions that are taken away. We are speaking the word from authority, from the authority of the Bible, Christ. So the presumption that we have is that everyone is wrong, and the Christian faith is the only right path. And so when we are really, I think one error that I see sometimes believers doing is trying to debate, and it's not biblical to debate. That's not evangelism. Evangelism is not a debate. And I do agree with what Sister Trace was saying. Because if you actually see throughout scripture, the apostles never get into a debate. They either reason, the you know, apostle Paul says he reasons with the people, meaning he presents the gospel, and if they don't receive it, he leaves. Like, right. have you seen this example mm -hmm. in verse 32? As soon as he mentions the resurrection, they get upset mm -hmm. uh, and you know, offended mm -hmm. and start mocking him. He doesn't sit there and try to prove to them, oh, resurrection is real, I mean, no, he just leaves. And I think there's, we, we come from a position of authority, really, as Christians. We are not, because when you are trying to debate, pretty much what you are doing is you are saying, I believe up to a point, and if you give me enough evidence, maybe I will be, and, and you know, I will change my mind. But that's not what a Christian is. A Christian is someone who believes Christ is the only way, and he's really giving the information. He's like, he's giving the news. He's not trying to learn something else. And I think we are coming from that position when we are ministering the gospel. Should be very careful to avoid debates. That's right. Final question. Final question. Uh, it's not a courtroom, a, court, a, a courtroom of law or anything of this nature. So everybody knows you can turn all facts to the side to that side. But you got to know what God's word is. You got to know what God's word is to you in your heart, truly. And again, that's why the critical piece is really to know the word for yourself and share what He's done for you. And I just want you to keep in mind that faith may not be the initial commonality. That's right. So you might not start the conversation talking about faith. As uh, Minister McQuaid was saying, affinity groups. Well, maybe it's somebody else who loves basketball. And you start talking about basketball. Or somebody who loves, you know, somebody who has an affinity with you. So you can, like, open the door and have a conversation with and then move to faith. So at least you won't be afraid to start because you're talking about something you love, you know, mm -hmm. basketball or something that you can they can identify with and shouldn't be a debate unless, you know, one of the Warrior fans doesn't accept the information. Hell no, hell no, I thought mm -hmm. too that it was it was really great that Paul showed up that one of the greatest students we have and, and as disciples was when we in our situation with the two of Larry and what yep. around us was taking place. That's like even when devil students and people come in the first time into our sanctuary and they see things and, and those devils will sometimes uh, and this is why there are people up dancing or running or speaking <coughs> in such tongues or kind of thing. And when you observe that there are people that have these questions or present them, then because of your understanding and knowledge and, and wisdom that like Paul having uh, of being able to, to teach the gospel that you're able to provide an answer. Mm -hmm. And when you can provide an answer, uh, that brings the boldness 
to what what he was bringing out about what makes gives him courage. Paul was courage because he had a true man. Yes. And he couldn't be anything but courage. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, well, uh, to go along with that uh, thing that Paul went there, like you said he observed what was there, but he also said that they were extremely religious. And you know, when people hear that, you know, I kind of they kind of get a little bit fucked up. So yeah, we are religious, you know. So he said, and the Lord was saying that he told me do this in ignorance. I'm not sure if he actually used the word ignorance, but he might have said you do it without full understanding. You know, ignorance is a lack of understanding or a lack of knowledge. He might have used a different term, but um, you just understanding of, of how you worship. And he observed that they had an altar to an unknown God. So he used that to say, to get the full understanding, you need to know who this un unknown God is. And um, also another thing I want to say was that when the Lord puts it on your heart to, to give a word to somebody, you know, we try to prejudge and say, oh, they don't accept it, not going to accept it. But we don't know how God has prepared that person before we go to talk to them. And all we have to do is say what God gave us to say. Because we're just one piece of the whole puzzle, uh, one part. You might plant a seed, somebody else later on, they say, that guy really strong in his faith. You know, I, I got to go check out what he was talking about, you know. And, you know, they may not accept it then, but if you really true and, and, and stand up for what you believe and really project that, they'll... You know, that's going to affect them one way or the other. They're going to say, well, he don't know what he's talking about. I need to do some more digging into to see why he's so, you know, so fervent about what he's saying. And, um, you know, later on, they, they see the award and that person might come to the Lord. Okay. Uh, I want to get to this last, this least cover this last section here. Did somebody get John 17, 1 through 5? Somebody else get Revelations 21, 1 through 7. In light of this passage, let's consider the three words mentioned in the introduction as a way to understand Paul's method of evangelism, Jesus, is personal, and cosmic. Jesus is personal and is cosmic. This whole concept of evangelism. For Paul... And for us, it's always the only, it, it's always and only all about Jesus. The gospel is defined entirely by the reality of Jesus' life and work. We talked about that earlier. The fullness of Jesus' life extends all the way back into eternity past. Which, which was, somebody's got John 17, 1 through 5? Yes, it reads. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory, <coughs> excuse me, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Hmm. All about Jesus, what God did for the Son. God the Son. And it extends into eternity's future. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adored for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall, there shall, no, there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. From the beginning to the end, it's all 
about Jesus. God's word is about Jesus. The only, only in Jesus do we find lasting peace, justice, and satisfaction. Through Jesus, we are redeemed, renewed, and restored. Does everybody understand that? Redeemed. We are redeemed. We are renewed. And we are restored. What is the gospel? It can be summarized in one name. Jesus. 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 And it is, again, personal. It's all about Jesus. What he's done, not about what we've done at all. Nothing we've done. Again, all those good things, all those things we do because our heart has changed and we do this for God. It's truly not about what we're doing. It's about what Jesus did. He was the only reason why we have a relationship with God because we were doomed to a life of captivity and bondage because of our nature. He wiped that away for what he did for us. And it's personal because now that we do have a relationship with God, it's an individual relationship with God. It's not about Ulysses. It's not about George. It's not about Pastor. It's not about Larry. It's about me and my relationship with God, knowing him and having that. Again, that's what I talked about before, running around and doing all these things right here. It's important. It's critical. And I'm doing good things. I'm teaching my kids, again, all the good things. But first and foremost is the relationship with him. It is personal talking to him on a day-to-day -day basis, just like my best friend, like my wife, like my husband, knowing him better than anybody else, having that relationship personal. And it's cosmic, and it talked about it in the two scriptures we just talked about from the beginning to the end. He controls everything. It talked about Jesus being with before the, before the earth was ever in existence. Ever in existence. He had a desire to come to save each and every one of us. So what did I tell you about tonight's lesson? <laughs> it's the best lesson you ever going to hear. It's the good news. And there's no other news that's better than the gospel. Amen. Amen. Well, I might go back to what I said before about when we witness to somebody, we're like a piece of a puzzle. Like, probably she just said, we're like one, one thread in a tapestry. It's <laughs> not a puzzle, it's a tapestry, but this thread is going to run through their life. And, you know, and they get other threads, and other threads that come in, and you know, come together, and, and hopefully they get to Christ. Okay, very good. All right. Y'all got the good news. Let's go out this week. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, we didn't get into what y'all did last week because I wanted to really talk a little bit about, about I didn't get into that part there because, again, I want to see, is, is, is anybody reading the mess, the uh, scriptures from the previous week and putting some of those things, answering some of those questions in your off time? We're not here Wednesday. You got seven days here. Take a look at a few of those scriptures. Take a look at a few of those scriptures there. And, and just, just, uh, it's just a few questions after each lesson, and it's impactful. Uh, after this, after uh, last week, I, there was some really good stuff in there about us. We just didn't get time to do it, so we're going to make time to make sure we do it next week. Uh, but look at those things. Look at those questions. Read up. It's a few scriptures. Like I said, it's a few scriptures. Not a lot to do. It won't take you long, but it's just a format for. Me. Uh, mind provoking things that uh, I think will help each and every one of us move forward in our relationship with God. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let's stand. I have a challenge for the class. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. On our weekly activity of the Google, it says share your faith in Jesus with at least one person this week. There you go. This may be intimidating, but remember that you don't need to give a speech or attempt to convince people in any way. You just need to tell your faith story simply and sincerely with love for the person with whom you share it with. So share your okay. story with one That's person. That's a challenge. Already Got that, Beverly? <laughs> <laughs> My buddy. <laughs> Any prayer requests?
Uh, my sister-in-law, Mary, uh, Mary McCullough. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you again, Father God, for this opportunity, Lord, to be in your house, Father God, to come together as believers, Father God, touching in the green, Father God, that you, we know you are our God, and that your word is the truth, Father God, and Jesus is our Lord and Savior, Father God, and we're humbly coming before you, Father God, saying thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this night, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be together, Lord, to discuss your word. To truly come closer to you, Father God, so we can do your will, Father God. Be true service unto you, Father God. We love you today, Lord. We worship you today, Father God. Oh, God, we're just, we just thankful right now for the joy that you give us day in and day out. But true joy is all about, Father God, really comes from you, Father God. So we ask right now, Lord, you would... We know you know all the prayer requests, Father God. We know you know every desire that we have, Father God. Touch them in a mighty way, Father God. Touch Don's surgery coming up in a mighty way, Lord. Touch Larry's uh, situation, Father God, in a mighty way, Lord. We ask you to touch Brother Hardaway in a mighty way, Father God. Touch our kids in a mighty way, Father God. Lord, just touch every situation, Father God. I won't be able to, uh, to bring them all to you, Father God, but we know that you can handle all things and you will do things, Father God, that's in your will, Father God, to allow us, Lord, to realize that things will be done by your will, Father God, and be patient and wait for you, Father God. Touch each person in the circle, Lord, bless the families, Father God, in a mighty way, Father God, let us all return home safely, Father God, and Lord, we just continue to give you all the honor and all the praise, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God. Thank you.